Okay. So what we have is we have a k minus one factorial, and then an m minus one minus k minus one, which is just an m minus k factorial, and then we have it divided by n choose k. Okay, what does that expression look a lot like? Yes? Yeah, the only thing is I need a k down below, so let's multiply by k over k. So this is the multiplication that could save lives. Right, so I multiply by k over k, let's pull out the n choose k. So I have a k divided by n choose k, the sum, n goes from k to n of m choose k. This is looking a lot like the German tank problem. If I wanted to just calculate you know, the probability, I would just sum m minus 1 choose k minus 1 over n choose k, m goes from k to n. What does this look like related to the tank problem? It's a slight twist on the original problem. What does it look like? It's similar to something. The original, we had 1 was the sum, m goes from k to n, of m minus 1 choose k minus 1 divided by n choose k. There was the probability when my maximum tank was labeled m, given that I've seen k tanks and n is the total number of tanks. So what would this look like? I have m choose k. Right, in addition to multiplying by 1, I do know one other thing. I can add 0. I can add zero. So I'm going to do both in one step to save time. k times n choose k plus 1 divided by n choose k times the sum n goes from k to n of m plus 1 minus 1, k plus 1 minus 1 divided by n choose k plus 1. Okay. Zero and one at the same time, right? Sadly, no logs. Block minus one. So, what does this sum look like? It looks like the original. What, what should that sum equal? It should equal 1. I was working on this um, last night. I realized, oh wait, today's Veterans Day. I should really change my lecture and you know, do something to honor the people who gave their lives or fortunately did not have to give their lives, just depending on the country. Uh, and for the longest time, I could not get the right answer. And then I realized this sum does not equal 1. It's almost 1. Why is it not equal to 1? I'm sorry? Because you have n choose k. No. I mean, that's basically, isn't that just almost replacing this with k with k it's plus 1? It's like you're starting from k plus 1. I'm so over here, my first thing is going to be, so if I have k tanks, that. I start off with m equals k. If I have k plus 1 tanks, I've got the m plus 1 here. I'm starting off with k plus 1. So could you plug in m and then add that to 1? It's not quite where I'm, yes. All right, the limits. Um, a little bit off. Yes, which limit is off? The bottom or the top? The top. Now if I put in the top over here as n, is everything fine? Can I have n plus 1 minus 1, n plus 1 minus 1, is that okay? Or even k minus 1, k over here, because k is at most n, is everything okay? Yeah. yeah. But think about this. When I'm doing this sum, the expression in here is one less than the maximum thing I observe. If I put an n over here and have the top being n, that means the second, you know, I'm, I'm choosing k tanks from n, and my largest tank is n plus 1. Can my largest tank be labeled n plus 1? 
No, that's the problem. The bound for the sum, if I want this to be 1, I don't sum all the way up to n. What do I sum up to? All right, am I allowed to just throw away one term in the sum? No. So what I have to do is I write this as n minus 1, and then I just have to add on that term separately. When I have the n term, I'll just have n choose k divided by n choose k plus 1. And now I can say this sum is equal to 1. But again, if my largest tank is m, then my remaining k minus 1 tanks are drawn up to m minus 1. That's why we had the m minus 1 choose here. If I summed this all the way up to n, I would be drawing uh, k tanks from n. And then my large one would have to be greater than n. That can't happen. So now this sum is going to be 1. This is nice. This and this cancel, right? So when this hits this, I get a k. And now when this hits this, all right, let's see what goes on. This sum is equal to 1, so I just have n choose k plus 1 over n choose k times k. So I'll have n factorial over k plus 1 factorial, n minus k minus 1 factorial. Now this one, I have a n factorial down below, and then it's k factorial, n minus k factorial upstairs. And so I get k plus k, the n factorials cancel, k factorial divided by k plus 1 factorial is 1 over k plus 1, n minus k over n minus k minus 1 is n minus k. Okay. Let's see if this is correct. And so this is going to be k over k plus 1 times n plus k minus k over k plus 1. And that should be the expected value of m. Okay. It's actually a little bit better not to do this algebra. It's a little bit better to leave it over here. And say, if this is the expected value of m, do I really care what the expected value of m is? No, what am I trying to find? The expected value, I'm, I'm trying to find n, right? And so I just realized, I want, I want to show mathematical simulation. Uh, I want to find the expected value, I want to find my best estimate for n. So what I want to do is I want to solve for n in terms of my estimate for m. So I just say, okay, look, I've got an n minus k here. I take m, I subtract k, I multiply by k plus 1 over k. So, and then I add k to it. So n, after you do some algebra, <coughs> my estimate for n is going to be k plus 1 over k times m bar. Um, and first I have to subtract k from that, and then I add k. And so the k over k gives me a minus 1, so I get a k plus 1 with a negative, and a k with a positive, so I get a negative 1. So I get k plus 1 over k times m. So that's my best estimate, estimate for n. Yes? In the second to last one, when we expand the equation, how, where, yeah, where do our m's go? From the m plus 1 minus 1, choose k plus 1. This whole thing over here equals 1. Oh, right. That sum equals 1. That was the whole point of doing the yeah, algebra. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Uh, everything good? So again, this is not exceptionally hard algebra. This is the same algebra we've been doing all semester. The difference is this algebra actually helped save lives. This algebra actually helped the allies figure out what the you know, German forces' you know, strength was. And again, 
this is the, what's known as the frequentist approach to statistics. There's the Bayesian approach. There's a big divide between the two fields. I strongly urge anybody who's interested in statistics to read the Wikipedia article and see a little bit about the difference between the two. But what I like about this problem is it's a wonderful application of what we've been seeing all semester. Whenever you get an answer, especially if you've taken a class with me, what should you say? What should you do as soon as you get an answer? See if it makes sense. See if it makes sense. Does this make sense? You know, give me some values of k and n. Do you think this answer makes sense? Let's say n is un let's say k equals n. What will I get for my estimate? If k equals n, what, what, what am I going to observe for n? Right. If k equals m, I've observed every tank. So in that case, m bar would be n. This would essentially just be uh, n. I would add just a little bit more, but then I subtract one. So it's going to be pretty close. Though. So this is very reasonable. And in fact, in, in the special case when k equals n, 1 over n times n is 1, which perfectly cancels with the minus 1. This gives you exactly the right answer in the case when uh, k equals n. What if k is small relative to n? Is your answer greater than or less than the observed largest tank? Greater than greater. Than. Yeah, it should be. You know, okay, maybe we're just a little bit about this minus one. But you know, if I have decent sizes for n, n is going to be a large number. When I multiply that, that should push it up. So I should at least be predicting more tanks than I've seen. You know, so if the large number I see is 1596, I'm not going to predict there are only 1500 tanks in theater. And it tells you that you need to inflate your estimate a little bit. You need to inflate your estimate by essentially 1 over k in your percent, where k is the number of tanks you observe. So the question, going back to what you said, is you're using the mean and doubling. It's a great thing, remember to email me. Which has a better variance, that or something along these lines? And so, uh, for the problem from earlier today, if you really know me, you would actually know what the right answer is. What's the right answer? This is who really knows their professor. One of my favorite numbers to use, 1701. So whoever gets to see your correct, this is I think one of the only times I've done clickers where almost a majority has gotten the correct answer. So 1701 is very nice for several reasons that I care about. You should try to figure out what those are. Uh, the Mathematica code is really not that bad to figure out something like this. And the slides are available online. You should know how to write code to do something like this. So I'm not requiring you to program in this <coughs> class, but I strongly urge you to practice things in Mathematica. Try to write your own code to do something like this. This is a skill you want to be able to have. Okay, and so here is the German tank problem. So let me just compile it. So what I'm going to do now is you can choose what numbers you want. I said, let's say there's 10,000 tanks and I'm going to observe a sample of size 10 and just see what am I going to predict. And I'm going to do this a thousand times. Okay, so a thousand different times I'm going to get a sample of 10 and I'll just, keep, and I'll just plot the results. It shouldn't take that long to run. Okay, here we go. So here's a plot. So the true value of n is 10,000. The average of my predicted runs is 99.83. And the standard deviation is about 913. So it's a significant standard deviation. You know, think of this as about 10%. Okay? But if I just do it, if I observe 100 tanks now out of 10,000, notice now the average of my predicted is only four less than true answer. And my sin deviation is only 110. So, for instance, instead of doing this a thousand times, if I just do it once, all right? Oh, that's right. Anybody know why I'm getting an error message? I'm trying to calculate the standard deviation uh, of running one, one trial, <laughs> and Mathematica is having issues with that. And I actually have to, you know, agree with Mathematica that it should have issues, but. <laughs> But so, you know, 
There, there is no, um, you know, standard deviation with just one measurement. So I'm off by 45 from the true value with just one iteration. That's not bad. You know, I observe 100 tanks out of 10,000. You know, do one more time. All right, so that one I'm off by a little bit more. And this is why you want to do it a couple times to really see. We just seem to be uh, pretty lucky that first time. Okay. This one you know, was another <coughs> really lucky one as well. But we're not off by too much. If I observe a thousand tanks, and then again, uh, we'll do this a thousand. Oops. We'll do this a thousand times. And now you see my you know, predicted value. The same deviation is only about nine tanks. Now again, if I'm observing a thousand tanks out of ten thousand, I'm observing ten percent of the tank population. But my error is significantly less. So you know, not surprisingly, the more you observe, the better you do. So a great problem for extra credit is calculate what would happen if you took the mean and doubled it, and see what would be the standard deviation when you do things with the mean. What would be the standard deviation when you do it like this? Can you actually calculate the standard deviation of m bar and somehow use the standard deviation of m bar to get something about the standard deviation of n estimate? Can you somehow pass that information along? Okay, so there's a lot of really good stuff here. You know, I know we were doing generating functions and convolutions, but you know, just based on what today was, this seemed like a really nice way to review of what we've done. We hadn't done clickers in a while. We hadn't done an application in a while. This is a good application. Okay, and also uh, your pre-registration is over, but I know a lot of people don't always register for math stats classes because we don't really turn people off. I'll turn people out. We can sometimes turn people off in class. <laughs> uh, if you're trying to think of what classes to take next, if you take a statistics class, especially an advanced stats class, you'll actually see how a lot of the probability we're developing is used, and you can begin to see now why it's not necessarily enough to just get a number. Oh, I, I love this. This is perfectly accurate. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> so at least, oh, I don't want perfection on the board. There we go. At least now the average is off by four. Okay. It's not enough to just get a number. You want to know, well, how close do I think the true answer is to what I observe? And so in statistics, you'll learn all the different tests, and you'll have the theory now to handle stuff like that. So the question just becomes, what would be your error estimates on n? So Given that I have some errors on my observed value for m bar, how does that translate to errors on n? Does the computer simply have to deal with how many observations you need to make? Does the what? Does the article that you're sending out on this deal with how many observations you have to make for this to be a good approximation? I can't remember if the article directly deals with that. But I mean, again, you can derive the theory and you can figure out exactly how many, how much of your error it is. And so, essentially, these two variables are related. If k is fixed, uncertainty in m will translate to uncertainty in n. And you can then figure out what your variance is. And so if you want to say, I want to be within 50 tanks, <coughs> how many observations k do I need? Well, now if you do that, now k is going to change as well. The other thing is, you may not want to be within 50 tanks. You may want to be in a certain percentage of the total number of tanks in theater. Which is, of course, a harder question to know because you don't necessarily know how many tanks are initially in theater. Okay. But, you know, again, if you want to try your hand, calculate the variance. And you'll see if you can you know, find clever ways to do this. You know, the key in what I'm erasing right now is we found a way to regroup this and write this as one. And again, for theoretical investigations, it's extremely important to be able to do this. And then for applications, I now have a formula that doesn't depend on horrible sums. And because I have a formula that doesn't have horrible dependence on the sums, I can actually invert things and I can make really nice predictions very quickly. I wouldn't be able to do that if I couldn't see a way to do something like that. And I won't say how many minutes this little fact over here cost. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to return to convolutions. And so we had done you know, the Poisson random variable before. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about well, what happens if we add two random variables. What happens to the generating functions? Generating functions of sums 
of random variables. What kind of random variables do I want to add? What kind of random variables do you want to study? Uniform random variables? That would be nice, but then that's a little bit limiting. So the nicer you make your random variables, the more limiting things are. What's the condition we have in the central limit then? What are we assuming about our random variables? Normal. Nope. We're trying to get that the sum is normal. But what are we studying in the central limit then? Independent. I'm sorry? Independent and identically. Independent, identically distributed random variables. So at some point, we might want to start making things identically distributed. But we definitely want independent. If things are not independent, it's going to be very hard. Imagine my random variables are x and x. Right, well, the distribution of x plus x is not that mysterious. The distribution of x minus x is not that mysterious either. x minus x is always 0. So if I have dependent random variables, it's very hard to figure out what's going on. So I want to study independent random variables. Right now, I'm not going to assume that they are identically distributed. I will assume say x1 and x2 are discrete on 0, 1, 2, all the way up to infinity. Right, just to make things easy, a lot of processes are like this. Think of it as how many heads you have when you toss a coin, or how long you wait until the first head, or the score on your next exam. Right. I am not able to grade to the fifth decimal point, I apologize. Okay? Lots of things we look at are discrete, taking on only integer values and frequently not negative values. I'm not expecting any negative scores on the next exam. Okay? The generating function of a sequence A was the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of a n s to the n. Let n be the probability some random variable takes on the value n. So if I look at gx1 of s, that's going to be the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity of probability x1 equals n, s to the n gx2 of s, I'll use a different letter, n goes from 0 to infinity, probability x2 equals m, sm, and now gx1 of s times gx2 of s is going to be the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of the probability x1 equals n, probability x2 equals m, s to the m plus n. Okay, when you look at this, this is not written well. Okay, it's written correctly, and of course that's a good start, but I don't really like how this is written. So g x1 of s, g of x2 of s. So it's the sum, m, n, go from 0 to infinity, probability x1 is n, probability x2 is m, s to the n plus n. So why is this not a, a great way of writing things? When you write a Taylor series, can someone tell me how, what a Taylor series looks like? Come on, give me like a Taylor series of a nice function that you know. How do you write a Taylor series? X to the n factorial. Okay, so, so the Taylor series for e to the x would be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. You would not write e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared plus 
x to the fourth minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 2 factorial minus x cubed over, you know, da, 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 right? Why wouldn't we do something like this? I'm sorry? <laughs> yes! Silly, dumb, stupid, annoying, less tractable. <laughs> if we did a clicker question, it should be clear which one you should choose. Yeah. The politically correct one is the less tractable. Right? <laughs> it makes it hard to understand what the hell is going on here. Right? You want to have all the x's together, all the x squareds together, all the x cubes together. You know, writing it like this, well, what's going on in x squared? Oh, wait, I've got an x squared over 2 over here that cancels it. Is there another x squared that's going to come down even later? I want to have all the x's of a given power together. When I write it like this, it's all over the place. So over here, the problem with s to the n plus m is if I want to see what's the first power of s, what's the second power of s, what's the third power of s, they're all combobulated together. And so I want to rearrange them. So what I want to do is I want to change variables. So this is one of the few times in the class where we actually need calc 3. And I want to change variables. So if you think about what's going on right now with my sum, here's n, here's m, and you know, you can do it either way. I'm basically doing it like this, or I was doing it vertically. What's the better way to do this sum? Diagonally. I want to switch like that. So I want to let k equal n plus m. And then I need another variable. So let's let j be my other variable. So I'll have, this is the sum, j goes from 0 to infinity, the sum, um, <coughs> k goes from, um, actually, do it this way, k goes from 0 to infinity, j goes from 0 to k. Because if I fix the exponent to be k, then what's the range for this? If the exponent equals k, what's the range for n? 0 to k. 0 to k. And the range of m, well, it's just going to be k minus n. So j is really the other variable. So j will go from 0 to n, and then by 0 to k. And this is what's happening for n. And then what's happening for m? m is just going to be k minus n. So once I know what the sum is, if I know the sum is equal to k, then the possible values for n goes from 0 to k. And once I know what n is, then m is forced upon me. m has to just be n minus k. So I get the probability x1 equals k times the probability x2 equals, uh, I'm sorry, j k minus j, s to the k. Does that j sum look familiar? What is that j sum? Yes. Wait, why does x, or probability of x1 equal j? Well, I'm changing variables from nm to kj. So the sum n plus m goes from 0 to k. So once you give me a value of k, I'm on a certain diagonal. And now j just counts as I walk down. Okay. And so j can go from 0 to n. So what does this look like? It's a convolution. It's a convolution. Which convolution? That your sum is k of the piece. Yeah. So this is the probability that x1 plus x2 equals k. It's a convolution. So we get that this is the sum, k goes from 0 to infinity, the probability x1 plus x2 equals k times s to the k. But that's just the generating function of x1 plus x2 to the s, of s. So we've just put the following really nice theorem. x1, x2 independent, 
as above, the generating function of x1 of s times the generating function of x2 of s is the generating function of the sum. Okay. If you remember from the integrations we did, finding the closed form expression for convolution was not always fun. Even if you like integration, it's still not that much fun at times. Is multiplying nice? So this is a really good trade-off. It allows you to pass from having to do a convolution to having to do a multiplication. And then the question is, can you somehow deduce things, bless you, from the generating functions? Bless you. Okay. So now that I know these two generating functions, I know the generating function of the sum. And in the case when things are identically distributed, this would just be the generating function of x1 squared. And so if I have n copies, it would be the generating function of x1 to the n. So it becomes a lot easier to understand what's going on. What you would like to do now is say that generating functions are unique. And if you know the generating function, then you uniquely know the distribution. Okay. If we knew that, then we would knew Poisson plus Poisson is Poisson. Because this was Poisson, this was Poisson, this was Poisson. So we showed that last time. Unfortunately, we didn't know that generating functions are unique. One of the reasons we didn't know that is because it's not true. Okay? But it is true in the special case when things are discrete. Right? So when things are discrete, the analysis becomes a lot easier. Essentially what's going on is when things are continuous, there's a continuum, there's an infinitude of difficulties. Okay. When things are discrete, yes, there can still be an infinitude of difficulties, but they're at least isolated from each other. And that makes things a lot easier to work with. So we'll end with the following theorem. Here. x1, x2 have generating functions that converge for the absolute value s less than delta, delta greater than 0, then x1 equals x2. So if two random variables have the same generating function and they're discrete, of course, no, discrete, no negative values. And the proof, there's several ways to do this. G of x1 of s is the sum, and it goes from 0 to infinity, probability x1 equals n, s to the n. G x2 of s is the sum, and it goes from 0 to infinity, probability x2 equals n, s to the n. So if I want to show that these functions are the same, if these random variables are the same, all I have to do is show that the coefficients are the same. So could I have two infinite series that agree for all values of s without their coefficients being the same? That's what this is basically saying. What's the easiest value of s to take? One. one. No, not one. Zero. zero. So if you take s equals zero, that gives you the probabilities are the same at n equals zero. And then what you can do is you can then subtract off the probability at zero, divide by s, and play the game again. Okay? Subtract, divide, replay. If you prefer to use calculus, what you would show is that if these series converge absolutely, then what you can do is you can differentiate term by term. And the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. If I differentiate this five times and then set s equal to zero, I'll get the coefficient of the probability that x1 equals five divided by, I'm sorry, times five factorial. Equals five factorial times the probability that x2 equals five. So you could also differentiate multiple times. All right, so now we know generating functions are unique in the discrete case. So in Wednesday's class, we'll continue and start dealing with what happens in the continuous case, and you're continuing to go through this chapter. <laughs>